But I want you to pull up close tonight because I want you to receive what it is the Lord would say to you. And I've grappled over this because there's, a, there's just probably a billion different things I could preach on this Thursday night, but there's only one right message, and I, I pray that I got a hold of the right one and uh, that it will speak to you. It may not be specifically for you, but may, maybe it is. And if it is, I want you to receive it with the goodness of the Lord. Because one of the things that ran through my mind as the Lord began to drop this into my spirit was this. I know we all go through stuff. And maybe, just maybe, you've been going through a season of your life, and I'm going to call it a tight season. Maybe you've been going through a tight season of your life, or you're about to go through one, and you've been wondering to yourself, why am I going through this? This doesn't make any sense. We've never had this kind of problem in our marriage. We've never had this problem in our church or our family. As a pastor, I've never had this problem. I never remember dealing with this before. Why this And why now? Why are we facing the things that we're facing? This does not make any sense. But by the help of the Holy Ghost, I pray that we we can help bring some clarity to maybe, just maybe, why that you're going through this. I want you to listen to the whole message because I believe there's something that God may drop in your spirit. Uh, We want to say thank you if you're watching online tonight. Like and share the video, if you will, with your friends and family because I believe there's more people that need to hear the Word of God. Jonah chapter number 1. We're going to turn to the old Jonah tonight. Amen. Some folks may think, man, I've been in church all my life, and I think I've learned about everything I can learn from Jonah. Uh, But praise God. I tell you what, there might just be something else you can glean from Jonah tonight. Jonah chapter 1. And we're going to turn to the latter part of chapter 1, and we're going to begin with verse 17. The latter part of Jonah, chapter 1, starting with verse 17. And then we're going to pick up the remainder of this in chapter number 2. And some of you may not realize this, but when the Bible was originally uh, written down with pen, paper, and ink, if you will, chiseled out in Flintstone or whatever, Uh, It did not have these divisions of chapters and verses. That is something that came along later to simplify and clarify things for us kind of folk like us. Uh, But nonetheless, this reads and runs right into chapter 2. If you got it, say amen. Jonah chapter 1, and we're going to go right into verse 2. While I'm getting there, I want to say thank you, uh, Brother Jesse, for helping me and taking some load off of me between him and Brother Danny, making sure the stuff on the media is right and tight and making sure everything's good. We just want to say thank you to them as well. Jonah chapter 1, verse 17, here we go. Now the Lord, who had done it? The Lord. Lord, girl, you got some lungs on you tonight, don't you? The Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Many of you know that there's an overlay here, maybe a type or a foreshadow that relates all the way back in, uh, up to the New Testament where that Jesus had died and rose again. You know there's a correlation there. Pick up in chapter 2, verse number 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by the reason or by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Aren't you glad when you mess up that God will still hear you? Amen. Verse number 3, for thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. And I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought me or brought up my life from corruption 
O Lord, my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. At the hardest place of your life, you do what Sister Ariana did tonight, and you reflect back on all God has blessed and done in the past, and you do like David when Ziklag was burned to the ground with fire, and you encourage yourself. How did David encourage himself in the Lord? He began to say things like, and God defeated the Amalekites, and God defeated the Jebusites, and God defeated the Canaanites. Je- David just went on a rampage about all the stuff good that God had done, and he encouraged himself. And so the Bible said, when my soul fainted within me, Jonah says, I remember the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. In other words, whenever somebody says God's forgot about you, he don't love you, they're forsaking their own mercy. That's what he's saying. Verse 9, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. God wants to hear it. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited. I'd like to say it puked out Jonah up on the dry land. I don't know about you, but whenever I read stuff, sometimes, sister, I'll be thinking like visually. I'm thinking about fish puke. You know what I mean? Here comes Jonah. He just got puked out on the beach, and all of a sudden he comes out. He's got weeds wrapped all around him. He's got fish slime and fish stank all over him, and he's running. What we say in the south, he's getting it. He's going to make Things right with God. I want to preach to you something that I've never preached on tonight on tight seasons for good reasons. Tight seasons for good reasons. Will you help me pray tonight? Dear Lamb of God, we thank you for this great privilege on this Thursday night to share the beautiful Word of God. We ask tonight, God, that you'll allow the Word to be in season for those that are hearing it online. It could be right now, tonight. It could be three hours from now. It could be five years from this date. But I pray the right person at the right time of their life will come across this word, and it will speak to them to become a word in season. And, Lord, it will speak to them in a way that they'll know without a doubt that you have their mail and you've read it back to them and you know what they're going through and you have the antidote and the answer. And we pray, God, that you'll add the anointing that makes preaching edifying and palatable in Jesus' name. Everyone can say amen. And you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. You know, there's a lot of reasons why that you may look at the text of Jonah and you ask yourself, what more can we get out of Jonah? I mean, we've preached about this guy so many times through the years. We've heard great preachers, probably even better than greater than myself, seasoned men of God, Bible teachers who have done a great job explaining all the ins and outs of the story of this man who looks more like a backslidden prophet than he does anything that has made things right with God and got his act together. But the one thing that God reminded me of when he laid this on my heart is that Jonah's story gives us insight into one of the many ways that God will handle his children in the times of rebellion. There are times of our life that we'd like to think highly of ourselves, that we're doing what God would have us to do. But believe it or not, you can walk contrary to the plan of God in just so many areas of your life. It could be your worship. It could be your study. It could be your witness. It could be your daily walk. It could be in a sanctified talk. It could be in so many things that you begin to walk in contrary or contrary to the Word of God or God's Word, and you begin to feel that conviction of the Holy Ghost as God begins to say, now, don't act like that. You know better than that. You know I didn't teach you to do like that. That's not my will for you to do this or to believe like that. There's times of our life that we need to have faith, but instead we are doubting God. If you've never been there before, well, hold on. You'll probably go through a season where that you'll have to feel or deal with that. But especially give that this is not a Philistine, this is not a Sodomite, this is not some corrupt evil son of Belial, this was God's 
prophet that we're talking about. Of all the people that this story could have been written about, we could have probably easily accepted it and understood it had it been somebody who was on the outside who would disobey God, maybe a Jebusite, a Canaanite, or somebody who was a God-hater. But this is not the case. As a matter of fact, this is a prophet of God that has been used in the past. So it's important for us to understand that just because God has used you in the past does not mean that you cannot fall by the wayside in the present. Doesn't mean that just because God used you in a prophetic and a great and profound way in your past that you cannot stumble and fall flat on your face and disobey God in the right now. And so somebody say, God, help me to make sure I don't fall into that place myself. But it's important for us to realize that not all difficult seasons are God sent or punishment that are meant for correction. I want you to realize that tonight because we're going to go back and forth with this a little bit before I'm done. But it's important that you understand that not all seasons are God sent or God allowed. Some things, tight places you go through, some of those dark hours that you pass through, those dreaded seasons of your life that feel like maybe God's forsaken you, they're not all God sent. As a matter of fact, there are some things that you go through that it's, it's more of an attack of the enemy. It's something the enemy has dispatched from hell to try to throw you off course. Or maybe it's like the serpent slithering up in the garden trying to get Eve to bite the wrong, the right, the wrong fruit, if you will, at the wrong time. And sometimes it is that way. How many of you can say amen? You understand what I mean. So yes, there are times uh, that it's nothing more than an all-out attack from hell. The demons of hell have been unleashed to come and uh, just come come at you with everything that hell's got. And there are times of our life that we may exaggerate it. I mean, uh, is it just me or sometimes we'll go through a season that's rough and tough and tight and, and we say, this is the worst thing I've ever been through. Am I the only one that's ever felt that or you heard that before you said that? This is the worst thing I've ever been through. In reality, it's not always the worst thing we've ever been through, but it may feel that way. Can you say amen to that? And so there are times that we go through these things, uh, and if we conclude that all the seasons that we go through are nothing more than the devil, I believe we can easily miss the lesson that God could be trying to teach us. Did, did you get that? I believe that if we're not careful that we can look at it and say it's nothing but the devil and miss the fact that there are times that God allows, that God dispatches certain seasons or sends certain trials into our life to teach us a lesson or to help us to become deeper and more rooted in the Lord. And if you blame it all on the devil and it turns out it's not the devil, well, guess what you might just do? You might miss the lesson that God is trying to teach you in that season of your life. A lot of times I reflect back. I posted it on my social media tonight. So if you want to look back, you'll see what I'm talking about. But there is a singer by the name of Bishop Paul Morton, and he sings a song that says, Whatever you're doing in this season, don't do it without me. Oh, I love that. I mean, Many times in my life through different difficulties and hard places and tight places that I've been through and painful seasons, I've often thought about the message in the song that Bishop Paul Morton sings, whatever you're doing in this season, don't do it without me. You know what he was saying in that song? You know what the lyrics of that song are trying to implicate? In other words, God, don't let me get blindsided by the pain and the adversity and the difficulty and the frustration of all that I'm going through, blame it all on the devil and miss the message in the mess, to miss the lesson in the midst of the trouble because sometimes God will use that because, see, here's the thing. Anybody ever remember when you were in high school or in grade school and they have final exams? Anybody ever took an FCAT or SAT or a final exam? A lot of times when they give you that final exam, it may be the most important test of the whole semester. And the reason is to make sure that you have learned something 
out of that semester. What good is it to take calculus if you come away and can only understand addition of subtraction? What good is it to go through certain courses if you don't learn in that semester or that season of your life? You got a hold of what I'm saying. And so they give you a final exam. And then you go in, you sit down, you get your pen or your paper or whatever out. You begin to check true or false or write your answer into place. And what is going to happen if you fail that exam? A lot of times, if you fail those exams, guess what you will have to do? You're going to have to retake that exam or that test again. And I don't know how you feel, but I'm sure you maybe feel kind of like I do. But I don't want to be blindsided blaming everything on the devil when God sent something into my life to teach me, to train me, to better me, to root me, to ground me. And I'm blaming it on the devil. And God said, son, you missed the message in the mess. And you're going to have to retake that test. Now listen to me, folks. If you know know anybody that's always going through a vicious cycle it's, you ever seen them revolving doors that you go through and some folks have joked around about people getting stuck in that revolving door they never come out on the other side they're always doing the same old thing kind of trapped in that revolving door never able to get out of that cycle well I've known people that I have pastored some that I've ran into as an evangelist some that I've known through my Christian walk that it seemed like they are always going through the same process and the same cycle. And I have to wonder to myself that at least a few of them, if it's not because that God's been trying to teach them something, God's been trying to show them something, and they've been missing the message in the mess they're going through. And they keep blaming it on the devil. Well, the devil did this, and the devil did that, and the devil fought me here, and the devil fought me there. Yes, God may have allowed that to happen, but what if God was trying to to teach you something like he did with Jonah. God was trying to teach Jonah about what happens as a consequence of your rebellion. Well, you might say, well, pastor, I'm a tithe payer. I'm a good Christian. I love my family. I'm good to my wife. I try to do right by God. But what if there's an area of your life that God is not pleased with and he's been trying to get you to address your attitude? He's been trying to get you to address whatever problem or area that it is in your life and you push it off to say I can't see where I could possibly do anything wrong you know what I mean because I'm tight and right and I got everything down pat and I got all my eyes dotted and all my T's crossed well you are probably the first one on the top of the list but I don't go nowhere and I don't do this and I don't do that and I don't do the other it could be your pride and all that you don't do it could be a number of things it could be your jealousy it could be your envy. It could be your gossip. It could be your lying tongue. It could be your nature because you have taken on the adopted a carnal nature that you look at everything. You walk and talk in everything in a fleshly carnal way and you stop walking in the spirit the way you used to. Does anyone follow what I'm saying? So what if tonight that God sent a whale, God sent a tight seas because of the place and the condition that you are in in your life. So tonight we could conclude that all the tight seasons, we could say it's all the devil. We could blame it all on the devil, but we might just be missing the message in the mess, and we might just have to retake that test. So it is true that there are times that God will strategically design a whale-like season to swallow us, and as a result of our own own rebellion and for as a form of God's correction God will through that place uh, that is tight uh, it could honestly tonight it could be a wake up call maybe we're going through something and we never stop to consider that God is in he's behind all of them you know how can God be behind all this trouble how can God be behind all this sickness how can God well listen to me it could be a wake up call that God sees secret sin 
sins in your life and God is not pleased with it. There are things you do behind closed doors. There are things you do when nobody's looking and you're going through it. And I've seen husbands drag their whole family. I've seen wives drag their whole family through painful seasons over and over and over because God was trying to get them to deal with their secret sin but they never would. Let me tell you, God's a gentleman and God will deal with you in secret and he'll deal with you and he'll convict you without ever calling your name. But if you won't deal with your secret sin, there will come a day when the God of all of glory will do like he did with King David and send a prophet along who looked him in the whites of his eyes and said, thou art the man. God will expose it if you will not put it on the altar. Somebody say, man, my God, I feel the Holy Ghost, but it might be a wake-up call. It could be like that pastor tonight who is trying to pastor a church and maybe you're listening tonight and you're saying, oh, I don't understand why that me and my wife are going through what we're going through. Why are we having to deal with this one and that one and everybody else and God sends a Karen your way. Now, if your name's Karen, that you understand. Uh, we have no odd or, you know, ill feelings, and Karen's a good name. You understand what I mean? But in the culture that we live in today, that's kind of uh, uh, that kind of identifies with somebody who's kind of nagging and got it's kind of crazy and uh, got all kind of problems. And as a pastor, I've pastored a few Karens. I pastored a few Ahabs and Jezebels, and God bless their heart. But let me tell you, you might be pastor in church, and you say, "Dear God, I'm about to lose my mind." Uh, God has sent us a Karen. God has sent some wolves among the sheep. God has sent us some tares among the wheat. We don't understand it. But let me tell you, it could very well be that God understands that whether you stay at that church or you leave that church, you're going to have to have a backbone, man of God. And you'll never know how to pastor a church if you can't deal with a few weeds, if you can't handle a few, a little junk here and there. You'll never be a seasoned man of God. When you're in your 60s, there are going to be young men that are looking up to you. There are going to be people people that look to you. How in the world are you going to counsel any other pastor? How are you going to give anybody else advice if you're not willing to deal with Karen, Ahab, and Jezebel? Where? Well, come on now and say amen. God sometimes, he'll send you into tight seasons but for a good reason. Before you quit that church, before you run down the road with your tail tucked between your legs, you better wake up and realize whether this is from the devil or whether God has allowed it to train you to toughen you and to make you a greater man of God somebody shout help us Lord amen he may use and uh, some have mentioned pray for our family tonight so this had nothing to do with that but I will tell you it's right here I can show you in the little side notes that the Holy Ghost laid in my heart he may even use a family fallout to teach you the art of forgiveness Oh, yeah. There are times that God strategically designs that whale. Do you know whenever Jonah described what it was like, he was describing these waves. Amen. I can imagine. Can you imagine what it might have been like to be inside the belly of a whale? I mean, it's tight. He said, I got seaweed wrapped around my head. I remember that one of my babies, when they were born, had the umbilical cord wrapped around their neck. And the doctors, when they when the baby's born like that, one of the first things they want to do, want to get that umbilical cord off their neck to make sure that they don't become brain damaged or they can breathe and all of that. Can you imagine being in a fish's guts and having seaweed wrapped around your head? Somebody say it was a tight place. The ribs of that fish were like bars. Hey man, here's Jonah describing it. It almost sounds like a prison, like a jail cell. It's a tight place of his life. A tight season of his life. Why am I going through this? Well, in Jonah's situation, Jonah ought to already knew what God was doing. God was punishing him because here you are, the prophet of God, and you're, come on now, you poor mouth, you don't want to do the will of God, and you're running the wrong direction. Oh, yeah, but God may use a fallout in your family to teach you the art of forgiveness. He might even allow you to pass through a tight financial season to teach you to trust in him. You know, we, we got a beautiful young couple here, and I can already tell you, if you ain't yet, eventually there'll probably come a time where you're going to go through a financial tight spot. But you know what that does? It gives you tenacity. 
And if one day you have babies of your own and they get grown and they're 18, 25, 30, my God, I hope inflation slows down before they get that old. You're able to look at your babies and say, look at here, mom and daddy, we had to scrap together. We had to pinch pennies. Daddy had to do Uber on the side. Mama had to try and do this and daddy had to do that. And this is how we got by. You will never be able to teach your babies uh, until you go through the crisis yourself. You'll never understand what it means to look at your children and say, yeah, I remember that time uh, that we were on the way to a church revival and we were broke as a joke. We pulled into a McDonald's uh, and we ordered a cheeseburger and cut it four ways uh, and one of us got a little tiny corner the other got a tiny corner and we all shared a a drink together. We don't know what it's like uh, and I've told my kids all these years uh, there's a lot of things I can give you. I can give you my last name. I can come on through the grace of God by the government's doing. I can make sure you got your own social security number. I can provide you with clothes. A food and a roof over your head. I can give you a lot of stuff, but I can't give you my struggle. And if you want to know what made me tough as nails, it was my struggle. You want to know what made me a, a pastor that knows how to deal with some junk? It was the junk I had to deal with that made me tough. Why do I got thick skin? It wasn't because I was born like that. I tell you, after a while, when you've been whipped and beat, amen, there's a scar that develops on you, and your skin gets thicker and thicker. And with wisdom, God develops you. Somebody say amen. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost tonight. But he may allow you to pass through that financial place to teach him to trust in teach you to trust in him. But God has a way of getting our attention. And if God cannot get your attention along the way, he will eventually use greater and greater things to get your attention. What do you mean? Well, look at Jonah. Here's a man, he's on his way down to the port. Here's a man who had a lot of opportunities along the way. He could have at some point changed his mind. You know, we may not see him visually like this, but I want you to see him like this. He is on his way, sister, down to the port, headed in that direction. He is headed to go do the wrong thing. Now, whether he had plans to do the wrong thing uh, uh, before he got there, that I don't know. But I know he's headed down to the port. And while he is headed down to the port, God has yet to be able to get his attention. He gets down to the port, and I want you to see this man, this man of God, he gets in the wrong line. Because there's a line to buy a ticket here and a line to buy a ticket there. And even if he was in the same old line, he's in the the wrong line for the wrong reason. And he's going to buy a ticket. The moment that the man says, where do you want to go to? And he says, well, I'm going to go over here. All right. He's already made his selection. He has paid for the wrong ticket. Every step along the journey, he could have made a decision. But God has yet to get his attention. And I'm here to preach to somebody. It's that God's been trying and trying, trying and trying, trying and trying, and yet to get your attention. Come on and say amen. I've counseled with men before that their wife had caught them looking at pornography countless times, and yet they would not get rid of it. They would not pray through over it. Amen. God kept trying to get their attention, but they kept just kind of putting it on the back burner. My God, you better wake up. We got one right now just found out. It's arrested here just a few weeks ago. Why? Because God dealt with them a long time ago but they pushed it off can you say help us all oh my God help us all but God's got a way of getting your attention when you're on the way to the port when you're standing in line for the ticket while you're purchasing uh, the ticket and the Bible said paying the fare thereof while, I mean I want you to see he's paid for his ticket now and now he's making his way over to the wrong boat and he, he steps over into the wrong boat Boat. Now he's on board the wrong boat. God still hasn't quite got his attention because if he did, he wouldn't be on the wrong boat. While he's on the wrong boat, he has an opportunity before they launch out to get off the wrong boat. But he chooses not to. I don't know. I've just pictured Jonah relaxing, reclining back like everything's fine. And all of a sudden, They pull up the gate, they pull up the ropes, whatever, the landing deck, whatever they have, and the the ship starts heading out into the ocean. He's out on the water when he's supposed to be going that way, and he's head over this way. He's making his way in the wrong direction, and God still hadn't quite got Jonah's attention. 
Why am I going through this? Why me, God? Why us? Why now? You know how many times I've counseled with families? And because of one spouse doing something ungodly, illicit, or wrong, they drug the whole family through the wrong. You have a praying husband or praying wife, and like, we don't understand what's going on. But if you knew the truth that there's sin in the camp, can you say that tonight? Sin in the camp. That's all it takes. Do you remember with Achan? With a wedge of gold and a Babylonian garment and a few shekels of silver under his tent floor buried. Do you remember that story? And so the children of God, they're going to battle like they always do. And I mean, they typically would be winning war after war, battle after battle. But all of a sudden, they started losing. And you know when they started losing, they said, wait a minute, back up. There's something wrong here. Because normally God would, normally God would favor us. There's got to be something wrong here somewhere. There's got to be sin in the camp. So they line up all the tribes, tribe by tribe, all 12 tribes. And the man of God goes to each tribe. And when he gets down to Achan's tribe, he stops and God said, there he is right there. That's him. That's the one. And when he questions him, do you know that because of one man's sin, That man not only caused a lot of people to die, innocent people to die in the battlefield simply because God was not getting his attention. And what's even worse than that? Read that story. It's tragic. They ended up taking that man and his whole family down into the valley. And I don't remember the valley of Achor, the valley of something. I forget the name of it. I preached it years ago. It's been too long for my mind to remember but they took him down to that valley. That valley had a name and a meaning to it. I wish I could remember it tonight, but they killed his whole entire family to put sin away from the camp of God. In other words, to send a message and to teach them a lesson. So don't think tonight that just because you think it's an innocent thing that you're doing what you're doing. I don't know why I feel like preaching this. Somebody really needs to hear this. Maybe it's just an innocent thing. It doesn't really matter if I talk like that, if I walk like that, if I act like that. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. God's going to love me no matter what I do. He's going to love you, but he ain't going to love what you're doing. Huh? Come on. He loves you enough that on a Thursday night, he sent me to tell you that there are tight seasons for good reasons. You mean to tell me God will allow me to go through some difficult places? I'm here to tell you God will allow you to lose everything you got. How do you know? Because I've been through it. God will get you down to a place at rock bottom where you're facing jail time, prison time, a divorce, your church closing down. God will allow all kind of things because God said, I'm going to get your attention one way or the other. If I was you and you knew this preaching, you're guilty, I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd say, okay, God, you got my attention. I feel the Holy Ghost. God, you got my attention. And while he's relaxing on board the wrong ship, he had an opportunity. But I can tell you that there are times that God will take us through those tight places. Here's old Jonah. He's in a tight season like bars and seaweed wrapped around him. But I want you to know something about tight seasons. You know what the Holy Ghost reminded me about tight seasons? Tight seasons have a way of changing things about you. Don't you know that's what God wants? God wants a change. God don't like the direction you're headed in. You know, you're supposed to be going to Nineveh and you're on a boat board the ship going to Tarshish. Amen. I, I don't understand tonight why that some people find it so hard to believe that God will allow you to go through things that will help you actually grow that are painful for you at the time and the moment. Why, why, was, why, you know, why would God allow me... Why would God allow this in my family? Maybe he's t- testing your faith because in future, in the future, he's going to use you in some ministry form and he cannot use you with shallow faith. He's got to do something to build your faith. I don't know why. I just feel the Holy Ghost. And I'm just telling you, he's got to build your faith. And you say, well, I don't know how. I, I don't know. Well, you know, that's the reason why he's allowed this thing to come into your life because to build your faith, you've got to face some junk. 
you cannot have patience until, come on now. You might have to be in a situation where you're praying, you're biting your fingers to, you know, oh God, our rent's due on the 5th and it's the 4th and I don't have a dime. I don't know what I'm, I don't know what we're going to do. And God said, trust me, lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge me and I will direct your path. I can make it happen. I can squeeze blood out of a turnip if I need to. Come on now, I can make water come out of a rock. I'm just God like that. Somebody give God praise. Amen. But for Jonah, that whale was a tight season. And tight seasons will change some things. The Holy Ghost showed me the first thing that a tight season will change. He will change your visual prescription. Anybody here wear eyeglasses or contacts? If you don't, God bless your no glass wearing self. I didn't have to wear glasses up until about 30 years old, and I wish I didn't have to wear them now. They drive me crazy, especially these bifocals, dumbest thing in the planet. It's what it seemed like to me. I can't stand them. I don't like to have to move my head up to find that spot in my glasses where I can actually see. You know what I'm saying? It's drive you nuts. But I will tell you, when I go down to the eye doctor, that eye doctor, often he'll do an annual exam. And you know what he wants to do? He wants to find out what is your current prescription. Do you know that tight places will change your visual prescription? What does that mean? God will say, last season, this was the prescription. And this this is what I put you through last season. But tight places uh, will change your visual prescription for you to see where God's taking you in this season. You've got to see through a different lens. You've got to see through a different eyes. You've got to see through a different way. You're no longer 25. You're no longer 38. You were 50 last year. You're 51 this year. And your visual prescription will often change. And for you to keep up with the pace, for you to keep up with what God has in store for you to keep up with what's in the future your visual prescription has got to change God wants to change the way you see it God says to you, this is how you've seen it all these years. You saw it, Sister Ariana, from a child's perspective, living in a pastor's home. But God says that was last year's prescription. This is this year's, my Lord, this is this year's prescription. What else will change when you go through tight places? Your attitude will change. That is the way you look at it, your attitude about it, and your reaction about it. Do you know that sometimes when you're carnal you get mad at God bitter towards God now I was thinking about this on the way to church it's a lot easier for us to blame it on the devil than it is to accept the fact that you mean God let my baby get sick to test our patience and our faith. it's easier to blame it on the devil because it's harder to accept the fact that God would allow us to go through stuff I mean it's easier to believe That the enemy would come along and snatch your car keys from you and say you're a sorry driver. And you can't have these keys back till you learn how to drive. Be easier to accept that than your own mama coming along, snatching the keys out of your hand and say, you are a sorry driver, son. And when you learn how to drive, I'm going to give you these keys back. You see, it's easier to believe an enemy. But God is not our enemy. God says to the church in the Revelations, He said, them that I love, I chasten. Come on now. God loves you enough to chasten you. He said, them that I love, I chasten. He said, tells them, therefore, repent. In other words, I'm not doing this because I'm trying to hurt you. I'm doing it because I'm trying to help you. You're never going to make it. If you can't get through this tight place, you're never going to make it where I want to take you to. This tight place will do something to you that when you get to Nineveh, you'll preach like a different man. I want to tell you, I don't know if you realize this, folks, but I want you to listen to me. One of the, do you know what the, one of the greatest numerical revivals recorded in the Bible? You know what it is? It was when Jonah went to Nineveh, and if memory serves me right, it was like an eight-word sermon. I got to preach 45 minutes or an hour to get some people to think about going to the altar. But this man, he got so changed, 
His attitude so rearranged in that fish's guts when he came out running wide open with weeds falling off and fish guts and slime on him. When he got to Nineveh, he preached an eight-word message and over 600,000 people repented. They were they repented so much that Sister Kim, they started putting sackcloth and ashes on the animals. Can you imagine riding down the road on your donkey or your camel? I mean, I guess they didn't have steering wheels, so they're riding down the road on old Camel Joe, you know? And while they're riding down the road on double hump Camel Joe, and they're looking down this way and looking at a man, did you see the neighbor? What's the matter? So your neighbor over there, he's got a couple calves in the back gate, and he's got a cow out front. He's got sackcloth and ashes on it. Hey, Amen. Did you see that guy? He's got Rover, the dog. You know, the little Yorkie? Yeah. He's got sackcloth and ashes on his doggie and his caddy, kitty caddy. And let me tell you something, folks. Uh, that may sound crazy because it sounds crazy to me, but can you imagine a man that come out so changed uh, that he preached that 600,000 people got saved? 600,000 people repented? I mean, that's a message. I would to God. I could just retire and stay home and me and Mama eat Krispy Kreme the rest of our life. Huh? Wouldn't have to preach no more. I mean, if I could preach like that. I mean, the man didn't even have the baptism of the Holy Ghost yet. I'm not saying he didn't have the Holy Ghost with him, but he wasn't baptized in the Holy Ghost And 600,000 people got saved. Somebody say, that boy got changed. Like that old song said, I know I've been changed. I I know I've been changed. Because the angels in heaven done signed my name. I'm just telling you tonight that God has tight seasons for good reasons. Oh, God, help us all. The third thing the Holy Ghost showed me as I slow down, getting ready to close here in a moment, is that God changes your directions and your plans. You're headed in the wrong direction. You think God's fixing to do a certain thing in your life. you got it already figured out in your mind. This is what God's going to do. This is all gonna, this is how it's all going to work out. God said, no, I'm going to change your direction. I'm going to change your plans. And when it falls through, you will know it as a confirmation that that wasn't what I wanted. Because if it was, I would have made sure that not a devil in hell could have rubber stamped it. Huh? Am I still preaching? Huh? The, 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 The devil's, you blame it all on the devil. But God said, no, honey. I grabbed a hold of that doorknob when the devil tried to sling it open. I said, no, 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 no. And I shut the door. And it was painful for you. You thought that I was punishing you. You thought I didn't love you. You thought I didn't answer your prayer. But the reality is I answered your prayer in a greater way than you realize. Those are tight seasons for good reasons. And I want, I want to share one last thing with you tonight as I close. Sister Miranda's coming to the piano to slow me down. I want you to listen to this very carefully. Those of you that hung around all this time, I don't want you to miss this. You may feel like you are going to die in this tight season. Pastor Myers, me and my wife, I don't know that we can take any more of this right here, what we're going through. I don't know, we're pastoring a church, we're evangelizing. I don't know how much more of this we can take. You know, blow after blow after blow. I just don't know how much more we can take. And it feels like we're going to die. Me and my husband were arguing and fussing and fighting all the time. I don't know how much more I can take of this. Feels like we're going to die. But the Holy Ghost dropped something in my spirit tonight that I thought was precious and powerful. Here's a man that probably thought, man, I'm going to die in this fish's mouth, in his belly. But even when you have done wrong, if you will submit to the challenge and the change and the tight season God allows you to go through, and you repent like Jonah did, God will keep you alive in tight places that you're not supposed to survive in. I don't know if you realize this, but we're not supposed to be able to survive in the, in the guts of a fish. Just so you know, in case you were wondering, we're not, the scientifically we're not supposed to be able to survive being swallowed by a fish. Um, that don't turn out very well. And there's some of you, you're not supposed to survive things like that. But when it's God and God's got his hand on you and you repent and give your submit to God, God said, 
you can survive. I will keep you alive in places and situations that you're not supposed to survive and get through. You're looking at your situation saying, I don't know how we're going to make it through this. But God says, I'm teaching you to trust me. Sometimes as a pastor, I will have people that reach out to me through email, private message, text message, phone calls, and, and things like that. And they, they'll explain to me the things they're going through and the, the sorrows and troubles and pains. And my heart always aches for them because I've been through a lot of stuff myself. And sometimes I'll listen to people tell me what they're going through, and I'll think to myself, boy, if I was in that situation, this is what I would do. But I always try to be very careful when I counsel or tell anybody to do anything to remind them, look, I don't have to live with the outcome of this situation. This is what I feel like if I was in your situation, I would probably do. But at day's end, you got to listen to God. You can't go by what I tell you. Unless the Lord speaks to me and gives me a personal revelation that I know without a doubt that I can say, God told me to tell you this, you're going to have to get a hold of God yourself. You can call a hundred people on the phone. Daddy, what would you do in this situation? Sister, brother, cousin, mother, what would you do in this situation? And you'll get a hundred different answers. But sometimes you just got to get on your face. It's good to have wisdom, and, and there's wisdom in the counsel of, of many people. But just be very careful that you don't go by what everybody thinks. Use it to illuminate your understanding. But at day's end, you got to get down on the altar and you got to pray and say, Lord, is this fish's guts? Is this because you're trying to teach me something? You're trying to show me something? Is there something in my life that I'm not realizing? Let me say this because I want you to really, I want to drive this point home very well. I've preached this out before, but how many of you remember where Jesus girded himself with a towel and he washed the disciples' feet. Do you remember that story? When Jesus girded himself and washed his disciples' feet, there's a message in that that you won't find unless you study the history of it. And what is that? Historically, it was a custom. But what they would do before dinner, they would go to the bathhouse and they would take a shower. When they came out of the bathhouse, they would walk from the bathhouse to the dinner table and sit down and they would eat. It was a common thing of their day. So now put this in perspective. The disciples and Jesus are at the dinner table. Very good chance they've already taken a shower. And Jesus comes along and he looks at Peter and says, I'm going to wash your feet. And Peter says, you're not, you're not going to wash my feet. I mean, first of all, you're the Lord and, and I'm clean. All of, you know, I've done, been in the bathhouse. I've done took a bath. I'm clean and wherewithal. But you see, the Lord knew something about Peter that Peter failed to realize. From the bathhouse to the dinner table, you can pick up something on your feet that you don't even know is there. It's easy. The Bible tells us not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to because there are times of your life you can pick up something that your husband's seen in you, your wife's seen in you, but you didn't see in you. It could be a spiritual blemish, a problem, something. And I believe that the best thing you could do tonight is go to the altar and say, God, whatever you're doing in this season, don't do it without me. I don't want to retake this exam. It's been too painful. I don't want to go through this process. If I'm supposed to learn something out of this, please show me what it is. And I'm opening up the altar. You can pray at your seat. You can pray in the front, wherever you'd like to pray. If you have to go home, you can do so as well. No hard feelings, but I just want you to get the message tonight. God has good reasons for those tight seasons. God has a purpose for that pain that you're going through. Maybe He's allowing you to develop patience, faith, to trust God in the most inconvenient and hard times. Pastor, I'm living with an unsaved wife. I'm living with an unsaved husband, and they're making my life so miserable. You continue to be the light. You continue to show forth the light of Christ. Because in your stability you have a greater chance that they'll get right and do what they're supposed to do. But if you let go in frustration, you're going to lose hope. You're going to lose your edge and your advantage, and you're going to mar your testimony. Pray tonight with us. Father, tonight we just thank you for this great opportunity to share the Word of God. For those that are in the altar, those who are praying in a place of prayer, I'm praying tonight, God, that you'll meet them in that prayer place to make a way where there seems to be no way. 
to speak to them in the places of their life, God, that they need a fresh right now word. Help them to find the answers that they so desperately need tonight. God, give them revelation. God, remind them that you love them, why they're going through what they're going through, why the battle has been so hard. God, if this is not the devil's doing, and, and if truly, God, you have allowed this thing to come my way, is, it, is there something in me? Can you do like David tonight and say, Lord, search me, try me, find anything. My life, I lay my life before you. I lay my soul before you. My marriage is in your hands. My life is all yours. Tell me, show me, help me. Because I don't want to leave the way I came. When things get hard and whenever the circumstances feel so tight, it's like being in the bars of that fish, the ribs of that fish. I remember. It's not because you don't love me. It's because you love me enough to help me to grow and to mature. This is a miserable season for you. I know it is. I just felt that in my spirit before I even preached tonight. It's a miserable place. Sometimes you just dread facing another day. It's miserable. God, you're, you're developing us. In this process of life, process of pain, you're developing us. Lord, I've done everything I can think of to do tonight. Said about all I can think to say. Inspired and led of the presence and the power of the Holy Ghost. I pray, God, take these seeds that have been given to me, Lord, that I have scattered tonight. God, I pray that as one man plants, and whether it's me, somebody else on the outside, let these seeds be watered. And as your word said, I pray, God, tonight that you will give the increase. Please, Lord, give the increase. Give the increase, oh God. Because if God has to get our attention flat on our back in a hospital bed, upside down in a car accident, in bankruptcy court, whatever God has to do to get your attention, it'll be for your own good. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world? And he loses his own soul. Lord, I just love you tonight. Lord, I submit my mind, my will to your will tonight. I ask you, Lord, to work in me, develop me, strengthen me. In Jesus' name.